Hello and welcome to another Sky Sports Cricket Lockdown Vodcast. Now, live sport has finally returned. Football, racing and the cricket is not too far away. But first of all, what did you make of your team Arsenal, Nass? Well, we've all waited for live sport because we'd like to know what, what's going to happen and the mystery of the result, what could possibly happen. Well, I think we knew what was going to happen with the Arsenal. <laughs> we were going to lose. City were going to nil, win 3-0. David Luiz was going to make a couple of hours, get sent off. Arsenal were going to have a couple of people stretch it off. So what have we waited for is exactly what you thought was going to happen before a ball was kicked. Typical <laughs> Arsenal, basically. Who, could, who would be sitting in an Arsenal board meeting two years ago when they got like the Keystone Cops at the back and their defence is all over the place and someone said, I know who will sign as a defender. David Luiz from Chelsea, who was absolutely having a shocker every time he plays. That was the worst signing of all time. Absolute shambles. Not only does he know everything about cricket now, he knows everything about football. It's unbelievable. He's and just putting away David Luiz and he's, well, he's placed for Brazil, doesn't he? He's a Brazilian <laughs> international and you're absolutely coating him off like you're some sort of legend. I mean, ridiculous. Uh, did, what about the crowd noise, though? What did you think? There was the Premier League channel had it with no noise, which to me sounded like, you know, when you watch your kids go for swimming lessons, which is horrendous. And actually, on the other side, with the crowd, that sort of hum, sounded quite good. What did you think, uh, Bumble? Yeah, it was fine. I, I didn't notice the crowd. I watched that game, Man City and Arsenal, and I've also watched the playoffs, League Two playoffs, and I think it's been fabulous. It, I mean, they've jumped through hoops to get it back on, and I think they've done brilliantly. Um, both on radio and on television. So, really looking forward to matches coming up. And the other big news, I mean, this is massive news, that uh, National League looked as if it was all going to finish, National League North and National League South. But at the 11th hour, there's been a massive turnaround. And so, National League North and South now are having playoffs, which is fantastic news for York City. Yeah. Couldn't have much about that. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you go with I'd that? Say I'm as excited. <laughs> what about you, Ath? Uh, when it comes to the cricket, um, would you be a fan? I mean, we don't know the answer, whether it's going to work or not. Would you be a fan of crowd hum or crowd noise? Or do you want it? Well, I haven't seen like any that? of the football yet. I'm going to be tuning in to watch my team tonight, obviously, against Spurs, United against Spurs. I suspect for the cricket, that kind of background hum won't be a bad thing. I think we, we've talked about it and we've referred to it as the Lord's hum, you know, that, that just gentle hum in the background. So you don't want something that's too intrusive, but I think you want something rather than nothing, just emptiness, I think, is probably going to be hard for everybody. So a gentle hum of the kind you get at the start of a Lord's Test match, um, yeah, probably a good thing. Do you think that we'll be more used to sort of, I mean, this is sort of slightly derogatory of all of us, will we be more used to lack of a crowd after doing a few championship games and playing championship cricket in front of less of a crowd than what a footballer would be used to, Nat? I think actually, myself, I think I speak for Athan Bumble here, some of the games we've enjoyed the most have been those championship games because... You have to, it gives you time to discuss things um, because of the silence, you can get into conversations, etc. So I don't think it's a bad thing for us as commentators, but obviously as the viewer, which is who the people we have to think about, the camera shots with no one in the background, it never looks good when you're trying to sell a product when there's no one in the background. But I completely agree. I think it were, we are, who have done some championship cricket in the past won't think, oh, wow, this is, this is absolutely alien to us. If anything, and the players themselves, you know, some of the West Indies players would have played with no one watching. England players domestically would have played with not many watching. So I don't think it'll be that alien to everyone, but we just got to make sure that the product that we put out is as the best that it can possibly be. The nearest it will be is to those test matches we've done in UAE and Abu Dhabi. If you think... What was the tour where Alistair Cook got 264 in Abu Dhabi? Wow. I was certainly there for that one. Um, and I reckon that's the closest, that virtually nobody in the ground. And of course, it didn't affect somebody like Cook, who a bit like Gooch before him, you just kind of feel would be 
the type of player who will just play regardless of atmosphere, noise, crowd. But I think there are some players who feed off, feed off the atmosphere in the ground and the noise of the crowd. Jason Holder, West Indies captain, was asked about this last week. And he said he feels like he's a player who, who feeds off the atmosphere in the ground. So I think it'll be slightly different depending on the type of character and the type of play, player that you are. Say Stokes is that, when you? you say Stokes yeah, is exactly. someone that turning up with no one watching. You know, maybe the captaincy, if Joe Root doesn't captain, maybe that will lift him a little bit. But Ben Stokes would be one who feeds off the crowd, as we saw last summer. We do so many matches that there is nobody there. It doesn't make any difference to us. The interesting thing for us would be the spectator reaction. And going back to football, it was fantastic to get it back on. And I assume that the Sky Football boys will sort of suck it and see how much noise to put in. And eventually you'll get it right. So if we have a, a Lord's Hum just un, under the, the sort of commentary, It'll be interesting how spectators see that because we do that many matches in different parts of the world where we would lament that there's not, nobody watching test match cricket. But in England, we fill the grounds, don't we? Every test match, it, it's full. So that's what's going to be alien. Right, OK. Let's change tack slightly. Um, so that cricket, well, 8th of July, that is the go date as far as that england West Indies series. Uh, is meant to commence or start? Uh, but let's go on to the one thing we've debated so many things in this lockdown. But the one thing that we've sort of missed out on is some of the great coaches. Now, I don't want to, Now, I know that we're all cricketers or ex-cricketers. So, but forgive us because we're going to sort of dive into all sports really a little bit on who some of the great leaders have been. Coaches, managers of anything of all sport in cricket. Let's start with that. Who have been some of the great coaches now? I'm obviously biased, but I only had one coach as captain, and it's a bloke that you disliked immensely. No, that that's was, not true. <laughs> that was Duncan Fletcher because he left you out or whatever, or uh, fell out with your mate Freddie. But I thought Duncan was the best, still do. I mean, Andy Flower obviously took England to number one, but Fletcher and Flower. Uh, for England would be the two standout. I've got to be very careful because we've got one of our ex-coaches <laughs> on this. Fletcher Flower and Bumble, obviously, were the three <laughs> groups. But uh, I just love Duncan because he, had a, he was a principal man. That he stood by what he believed in. You can argue whether he was right or wrong with pace in the bowling, um, you know, character in the batting, etc., fitness. But Duncan had, Duncan had these principles but whatever the press was saying, whatever anyone else was saying, he was going to stick through that through the five or six years that he was around. And I admired him for doing that. So I will always have Fletcher as one of the great England coaches, one of the great coaches in world cricket. You would have played under him, Matt? Yeah, and I'd make the distinction, actually, between coaching and managing. And we'll get into all this, but I think that they're two very different things, actually. Um, and a coach, I, if you're talking pure coaching, I see somebody who has technical expertise. You know, he can tell you or me what we're doing wrong with our batting or Harmison or whoever, what they're doing wrong with their bowling. And I know you have your specialist batting and bowling coaches now. That's been a more recent development. But a coach, I see purely as a, almost a technical person. A manager, I see as something different. A manager is somebody who has an overview of the whole thing and he's looking to, it's more of a, a kind of people person job, if you like. He's dealing with the characters in the team, trying to get the best out of them. And he might have a staff now. England have probably a backroom staff of 18. So they need somebody to almost manage that process. So I'd separate coaching and managing. I saw Duncan as a very good technical coach particularly for batting actually although he obviously knew the game in the round I thought in terms of batting he was an excellent technical coach he knew the angles of the game he knew the nuances of the game and he'd make a good player a good batsman better and that's that might sound obvious and easy but I actually think it's far easier for a coach to make a player worse than better I think there are a lot of bad coaches around and I think it's a bad coach uh, can have far more damage uh, 
uh, than what a good coach can do. And I'm sure I've expressed that uh, brilliantly. Uh, but I think it's easier for a bad coach to have a much more negative impact. <laughs> Well, were, you, were you a manager or a coach when you were coach of England and Lancashire? More, more of a manager. You, different eras, totally different eras. I'm going to talk about Mickey Stewart. And I agree with Nasser. The two most impressive that I've seen have been um, Duncan Fletcher and Andy Flower. But also, from looking from a distance, I really like Darren Lehman. Yeah. He was really up and at him, a bit in your face typically Australian, and I think he suited Australia. You could talk about Buchanan, who was more of a thinker. And then you can look at strengths and weaknesses of opposition. So when Duncan came in, he's got central contracts. That's the word with all. That was everything. Central contracts, because you've got them. You've got the players. You can do things. The players, I would think, would be insatiable and wanted to do things. So that was around about 2000, wasn't it? But Mickey Stewart was probably England's first coach. And he was an organiser, facilitator, getting everything ready for the players to play. And then you hand it over to the captain, which is something else we can talk. If, if these two lads, captains, Nasser Hussain and Michael Abberton, they wouldn't want somebody saying, do this, do this, do this. They'd just tell you where to go. So there's a point when you hand over the team to the captain. The captain runs the show for five days. You're talking about Mickey Stewart there, Bumble. That's 1986, 87. Mm. The first professional manager coach yeah. that England have had. And it's something about the game. Cricket has come very late to coaching. It's a big thing now. As I said 18 backroom staff that England will have. But it's a relatively recent thing in cricket. If you compare it to football, say, where the great managers, you know, you can think of England's World Cup winning side, Alf Ramsey in the 60s, coaching and managing in football, long predated cricket. Go, go to the States, where the cult of the, the coach and the manager is very strong. We, I'm sure we've all watched The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary, Phil, Phil Jackson there. And you can talk about people like John Wooden, who I, I don't know how, how up we are on American sports, but these are legendary figures in coaching, Vince Lombardi in the States, and, and cricket really hasn't had that so much. It was more your old pro or your, your finishing pro would come and be given a job uh, as a second 11 coach or first 11 coach, and it, and it, it just seamlessly went into coaching, whereas I think now what will happen in cricket, there'll be this professional class of coaches and managers that will develop much in the same way as it has in football and, and as, it, as it has in the States, and really hasn't in cricket very much at all. I agree with on Bumble and Art's points, in that Bumble's point is an excellent one about central contracts. Before central contracts, people like Mickey, and I played under both of them, Mickey Stewart and Bumble, they were so busy chasing their tail with were players fit. What are the pitches going to be like? I need to ring up that edge baston groundsman you know, sort out nets, sort out balls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that the actual coaching bit of things was way down the list because they had so much on their plate. But because of central contracts, because of money from broadcast deals, you have a bigger backroom staff that takes all that away, takes the facilitating role and the managerial role away so that your coach, Flower, and Fletcher can actually coach. So I think Bumble and Mickey before him, if they had had central contracts, could actually do a bit more coaching. And to go back to Ath's point about making a player better, what I found about Duncan, before Duncan, I'm talking about various coaches all around the world, people used to tell me and tell other cricketers what they were doing wrong. And we do it on Sky now when we do our analysis. What does Wesley do wrong? Or Zach Crawley with his back face. Not what you do wrong, it's what, what are you going to do right? How are you going to correct it? How are you going to put it right? And that's what Duncan was very good at. He would look at someone's trigger movements, look at analyse an opposition and work out not only what they were doing wrong, but how we could get them out, how a player on our side could improve. So it's about player improvement. Well, and equipment. I mean, them lads will remember that we used to travel the world with coffins 
full of VHS strengths and weaknesses of opposition. I mean, but coffins full of them. Now everything's on a laptop, so technology has improved coaching as well. The, the lad can come off batting and he's, he's just out and he can look if he wants, if he wants, he can look at it technically immediately with somebody that he trusts. He might trust the head coach, he might trust the batting coach, he might trust a senior pro in the team, but he can look at it immediately and see what he's, I like Nasser's point, Tell me what he's doing well. I sat in that many meetings. He can't do this. He can't do that. He doesn't do it. Tell me what he's good at. Tell me what he's good at. You can improve the rest of it. Do you think we'll get to a point in cricket where you have a crossover of sports? I'm thinking of Clive Woodward, who obviously led England to World Cup success and then went over to the... Ran the Olympics, didn't he? He was the chef of the mission for the Olympics. And I think he had a short stint at Southampton Football Club, did he? Am I right? He did. He did. I mean, you could never see somebody like that becoming the technical coach, say the batting coach or the bowling coach of an England side. But could you see somebody like that from a different sport coming in as the manager above, in, I suppose, in Silverwood's position now with the specialist coaches underneath him? Could you see somebody doing that job who's never played international cricket and indeed has come from another sport will that happen do you think it's a good question because they'll always fall, fall foul of the fact of you've never been there you've never done it what do you know about our sport when things start going in the wrong direction which they always do even if you're fletcher or flower or whatever the wheels come off eventually and there will always be that go-to line um, and in fact even within a sport, there are those arguments. I know when Duncan took over, Duncan was very wor worried about test match cricket because he'd never played a test match. He was less worried about white ball cricket because he played for Zimbabwe in white ball cricket. And the anomaly actually was that he turned around our test match form to a degree, but not really our white ball form. And then on football, you have football managers who weren't, didn't play the game. Mourinho is a classic one. I mean, Jose Mourinho's football record is as a manager. So do you have to have played that game at the highest level to be able to coach it? It's suggestions in football that you don't. But it'd be very odd for a, a football coach to suddenly come and be involved in cricket unless it's to oversee things. That, that's why my point at the start about the differential between coaching and managing. They're two very different disciplines, I, I see them as. Um, and, you know, I suspect we'll get a kind of... Already with T20 franchises, you're getting this almost a mimicking of what happened in, what happened in baseball. So you're getting like a backroom staff now, you know, the Billy Bean, Moneyball, all that kind of thing from Oakland days. That's starting to happen in, in T20 franchises. Um, so I see a lot of the things... America's often ahead of the game. Uh, and I see cricket kind of catching up to, to what's happened in, in baseball uh, and, uh, and over the pond. Yeah, I mean, we've nearly got it in England in that Ashley Giles is overseeing everything. And underneath him, he has a layer of coaches and he's got a head coach and specialist coaches. We're nearly there. So I've does that I'm, man, does Ashley Giles' position have to be a former cricketer? No. No, I don't think it does. But, it, but also to dissect what Ashley does is in charge of everything but what probably what we're talking about is the the men's senior international team to have a manager and then a coaching staff underneath I think that's the way to go the other thing that I mean that's a good debate that you don't need somebody who's actually played the game I, I believe that you're talking about watching football tonight and I'm just going to digress ever so slightly you're going to watch a match tonight. And I'm looking forward to the day, this may happen, when the football team come out for the warm-ups with a set of stumps, a bat, <laughs> some pads, a ball, and, and have, a, you know, have a little game, you know, a bit of touch and running. And get, it'll be marvellous. <laughs> You've seen them all, Bumble. Uh, talking football, who, you know, going back to 1950s and beyond, who, who would you put in your top rank football managers that you've seen, the handful of, of the greats? Uh, well, Matt Busby, uh, Bill Shankly and anybody else from Liverpool in that production line, Alex Ferguson, uh, Jock Steen, some there's fantastic there's, there's, managers. I mean, people have often talked about that uh, 
Steen, Shankly, Ferguson, yeah. similar yeah. areas in Scotland. Yeah. None of them absolutely top rank, top flight players. Yeah, but they all had something. Yeah, Vic Buckingham going way, way back. Um, Alf Ramsey was a wonderful footballer. Uh, but again, I would say that they were re they were man managers. They were managers, and they had good coaching staffs under them, good senior professionals, a different era. Uh, but in this modern era, you're looking at Guardiola looks to be a fantastic manager. John Coleman, who you won't know, he's the manager at Accrington Stanley, is absolutely unbelievable to have brought Accrington Stanley from non-league football to League One. That is genius. Him and Jimmy Bell, that, that is proper management, not at the highest level. So there are some wonderful managers. I'll tell you another. Who Clough, comes top, you didn't mention top Clough. Manager. Brian Clough, fabulous. Outrageous. Uh, outrageous. Sam Allardyce. A real trailblazer, Sam Allardyce, with the stuff that he did at Bolton, at Bolton Wanderers. A real trailblazer about nutrition, fitness, um, the biomechanics. He did the lot. That's the difference, though, isn't it? Football and cricket. I mean, uh, an England cricket coach manager can't go off and buy a player. You could argue about yeah. a couple of uh, yeah. recent yeah. ones that they've that come in, but in football you can. So, how do you decide who's a good football manager? You know, is Mourinho, uh, Pep, how do you know they're better than Sheffield United manager, Burnley mm -hmm. manager, people mm -hmm. who keep punching above their weight on low budgets, etc.? Yeah, I, I agree. Sean Dyche at Burnley has done an incredible job. And so there are that calibre of managers that, you know, they, if put them in charge of Manchester City or Barcelona, would they do the job? Would they do exactly the same? What were he called at Peterborough? He, he, he was brilliant. Very Fry. Very Fry, magnificent. <laughs> I mean, what a manager he was. Very Fry. Fantastic. Jimmy Searle. Uh, he was brilliant. Jimmy Searle. Where did he manage? But Keezy, you obviously Keezy, like Al Pacino because you sent us that stuff ahead of this <laughs> vodcast about, uh, what was it, Any Given Sunday and that great team talk that he gave in that film. The warm up, yeah. <laughs> But on YouTube, you can see all of that. But the, the one thing I'd say, and this is the same in cricket, which I see that they're just trying to change a little bit. All those people you mentioned, Bumble, and the Guardiolas, the Klops, all of these people, and the same in cricket, Fletcher, um, you know, you go to Fletcher. Gary Thurston, Fleming, all these people. Do we put a downer on English coaches and English mm -hmm. managers? We don't give these guys the opportunity that we give foreign coaches and managers in nearly all of our sports. Is that fair? Why is that? Come on, Ash. Well, we haven't given, it's been a big story about the 100, hasn't it? I know the 100's not happening this year and will happen next year, but the, the head coaches of every franchise in the 100 was an overseas coach. I can't think of a homegrown coach that was given an opportunity in the 100 and plenty of people had a, had a bit to say about that. I think it was Ferguson, Alex Ferguson, who once made the comment about uh, managers with laptops, almost that we, we see a, a foreign coach or a foreign manager with a funny sounding name and a laptop and, and automatically this reputation um, builds around them that perhaps they've got a bit more wisdom and knowledge than ours, Arsene Wenger, of course, who's a brilliant coach of Arsenal. Um, but I think sometimes we do have a bit of a, a down on our home coaches. But I think it's partly, again, because there just hasn't been such a cult of coaching and managing here in the game. It's a very recent um, exercise. And I think as we move forward, I think more, more resources will be put in. There'll be a professional class of, of coaching and managing. You know, at Manchester University now, you can do a, um, a degree in the kind of job that Ashley Giles has. It's called a sports directorship degree. And that's a relatively recent thing. So I just think you'll get a, almost a professional class now that comes through the English system. Do you also think that, you know, like an English coach at times sounds a bit more polished because they've, right, they hasn't been there for a long time. You know, so they sound, they're almost talking like manager and coach speak, almost like middle management and business. Whereas if you look at the Aussies, who we seem to give the key to the city as far as our coaching is concerned, they're the complete opposite. They sound rough and ready. You know, you get an Aussie coach, Trevor Bayliss, come over and they go, oh, yeah, you know, and they, they don't sound like they're, 
you know. See, ba Bailey's what, is absolutely fascinating to me, and, and you probably know him better than probably the rest of us, Rob, because you play a bit of golf with him here and there. The players <laughs> speak unbelievably highly of Trevor Bayliss. Unbelievably highly. They, they love him to bits. He's got an outstanding record, particularly in, in white ball cricket. Although if you spoke to him, he'd profess a greater love of test cricket and red ball cricket. But if you said to me, having watched, you know, that period under Bayliss, if you said to me, what did Trevor Bayliss do? I'd be stumped really to know what he did. So it's a very difficult thing sometimes because what we're not seeing, although we've started to see it a little bit now with documentaries like The Test and the documentary of Manchester City about Guardiola, or often they're a bit PR-ish jobs. What we don't see is what happens behind the scenes. And I think what they loved about Bayliss was just this ability to remove pressure, you know, play at the top level, all that pressure is there. And what you actually want is so, somebody to remove it rather than add layers of pressure. But we don't see that. And so it can be very difficult for us from a distance and from the outside, passing judgment on stuff that goes on in those four walls, which is where it all happens, really. But this is the thing, Nass. You know, all right, take Langer in that documentary. Would he not have driven you mad as a player, him being the coach? Absolutely. but. You, as with captains, you need coaches will be for certain times and certain environments. So you've got to put it in context of when Langer was coming in, Australian cricket was at a low point, sandpaper gate, etc. their whole system being torn apart, and they needed to go back, however much it makes us a little bit sick, they needed to go back to that baggy green mantra and all the stuff, you know, elite mateship or whatever they call it, the stuff that we laugh at, but was so required for that Australian squad at that particular time. And going back to Ad's point about Bayliss, it's all linked up. The decision made, I remember driving Chelmsford and I had to pull over. Straussy rang me up and said, what do you reckon about the new coach? And I said, yeah, I mean, there's some great you know, ones out there, Gillespie, et cetera, there's people. And he went, no, 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 I want someone to take a backward step. You know, they'd mentioned Peter Moore's being that woodpecker that had annoyed Peterson annoyed quite a few of the players, even though Peter, Peter Moore's record as an English coach in England is virtually second to none, and people speak very highly of him domestically. But Strauss wanted someone to let the players go out and express themselves and take a backward step. So Ath is absolutely spot on. England's greatest ever white ball coach, his greatest thing that he did was actually doing nothing, was actually saying, over to you boys, You've talked a good game about how you're going to go out and be carefree. I'm going to let you do it. And he never down. This goes back to my Fletcher point. Have your principles and never turn on those ten principles. Never doubt yourself. And Bayliss, when they were being rolled over or playing silly shots, Bayliss never came to me or Ath or Bumble or you or Wardy and went, no, nah, they weren't very good today. That was rubbish. We won't be doing that again. We're going to go back to the old way. He just said, we'll do it again. And he stuck by his principles. All right. But then all these coaches that we, or these managers that we're talking about, Guardiola, um, Klopp, uh, Trevor Bayliss, all these people, the one thing they have, Phil Jackson that you spoke about, you know, I thought it was fascinating in that last dance, is that they just had great teams. Trevor Bayliss, if you're the but great... Am I right in saying, Rob, that Phil Jackson, uh, did he coach at the Lakers after the Bulls? Yeah. And he went and was very successful with the Lakers as well, wasn't he? I don't know how good a team... I don't know anything about basketball, really. I don't know how good a team he was. But it wasn't just that he, he coached a team led by Michael Jordan. He, he actually went and did it elsewhere as well, didn't he? Well, that's why... I, and what he also seemed to have, he was a man manager, wasn't he? Which I would argue that Fletch wasn't as much. You know, Fletch was a very good, I thought he was an excellent technical coach, had a great read of the game, but he wasn't the greatest man manager of managing everyone from your Freddies, your Harmies, people like that. You know, in international cricket, you don't have to make doing county cricket. You have to try and get the best of what you've got. In international cricket, you can go and pick other people. Um, so my point really is this whole manager thing, you know, do we give them far too much credit almost coaches that what Bayliss did after 2015 they picked a almost completely different personnel Phil Jackson you know 
again, he had a good side around him. Guardiola had a good, has a good side. If he doesn't, he buys one in. The same with Klopp, the same with all these people. But nowadays, different to Clough and people like that, are you not just at the mercy, regardless of your ability as a coach, to the players that you've got around you? But there are coaches who, to take Alex Ferguson, who build three yeah. or four different teams. He wasn't just successful with one team, one moment. He's done it time and time again. He did it with Aberdeen. He took a smallish club in Scotland and yeah. challenged, challenged the duopoly of, of Rangers and, and Celtic. He, he, did this, he, he took four or five teams at United to, to the Premiership. Don't tell me that that bloke hasn't got something. I, don't, I, I refuse to believe that he was not one of the great coaches and, 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 or managers, whichever one you want to, whichever uh, thing you want to put him in there. Go on, Bob. He, 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 was a, he was a manager, Alex Ferguson, definitely a manager. And just on what I said there, I'll come back to John Coleman. You can sniff and laugh at it. Fantastic genius for a, a club like Accrington Stanley to get him into League One with the lowest budget ever. And the other thing I can help others with, he said he knows nothing about basketball. Now, I can help him there. <laughs> you get it, it's a round ball, and you <laughs> tap it on the, and run. You run to the other end and chuck it in a net. And then the other lot go up the other end, tapping it and running. And you can pass it to your mates, and then they chuck it in a net. That, that's basketball. You mentioned Langer before, Rob. I thought there was a beautiful moment in that document. I was just trying to put myself in Aaron Finch's position. There was a moment, I don't know whether you remember it, where Finch didn't review. It was either a court behind or an LBW that was so obviously not out and he didn't review it. And then he came back into the dressing room and, and Langer, the coach, is there at him. Why didn't you review that? Why didn't you review that? I was just thinking, if I'd have been Aaron Finch at that moment, <laughs> I'd have wrapped my bat around, around Langer's head. But it, that, that showed me the difference between when I played and uh, the generation now, just how much more dominant the coach was. Of course, we don't know whether it's the absolute accurate picture, but the dominant figure in that documentary was not Tim Payne, the captain. It was Justin Langer, the coach. And that is a massive change from the massive people would have played and Nass yeah. and myself played. But it, again, though, he still, you know, they still had the Cummins. They, you know, they, he had that bowling attack. He had Steve Smith. You know, I'm almost thinking that the more you watch it, what is that thing? You know, you talk about Ferguson. That's a good point. Because he's, what they seen, and Steve Jobs would probably say the same thing, or obviously he wouldn't say it now, but would have done on that you've just got to be the best talent scout you can possibly be. You know, you've got to somehow make sure you're picking the right people to build that side around. Yeah. And then you just let them go. Is that not right? Yeah, you're absolutely spot on. Players win you games. And you look at Jurgen Klopp, for example. Jurgen Klopp, when he came in, Liverpool had that attacking force, but they were still a little bit like Arsenal now. A shambles at the back with Mignolet and their back four were making mistakes. He went and bought Alisson and Van Dijk. And now that spine of Liverpool, they are unbeatable. So he has bought some success. But also, Jurgen Klopp has created a culture. Make no mistake, he's made them believe in what Liverpool, what it's all about being a Liverpool. You watch him at the end, the way when they win games and he's punching his chest. Liverpool just love that bloke. So you play for that bloke more than you would for any other manager not any other, but recent managers. So he has created a culture where he's made that side realise what being a Liverpool player is all about. But also, going to Ad's point about Ferguson, and this contradicts myself a bit, Rob, is that you must have principles, but you must be able to adapt with time. The game changes. Even us as broadcasters have to realise that. We can't just sit there and say, well, we didn't do that in our day, so it's wrong. And I believe managers, whether it be cricket, football, whatever, you look at Mourinho. Mourinho hasn't done it recently because he's, not, he's been stubborn and he, he's not willing to change that the game has moved on and the press and all this sort of stuff. Same with cricket. If you think as a manager and a coach, well, that's not how we used to play the game. The game changed. Duncan said it to me when I got this job at Sky. He tapped me on the shoulder and he said, well done, that's great job. But just remember, in three years' time, this game will be different from what it is now. And you better move with the times. 
And I think that's a lesson for the radio manager or broadcaster or whatever. The game changes very quickly and keep up with that pace of change that Ferguson and all the greats have done. That's an interesting point. I wanted to touch on that with something I was writing about the other day about the style of a team. You know, you say the game changes and you have to be pragmatic and you have to be flexible, which I agree with all that. Do you think, though, that a manager has to uh, be aware of the history and culture of a club? So I'm thinking, so, so, talk about United, which obviously my team. Ferguson seemed to tap into the Busby way, which was give young players a chance, play with flair and, and freedom. And that was part of, part of the ethos of, of Manchester United. Do you, I was thinking about it in the, in the context of West Indies the other day and the fact that they seem to be going back now to producing fast bowlers and they seem to at least be more of a, of a West Indian way about it. Do you think that's important? Does a coach and a manager have to reflect and fit in with the ethos and culture of a team or a club? Yeah, but remembering that that can change. Mm. You know, you, you aren't just tied to history. You can create your own future. You can create your own ethos and, and, and change things as well. So I agree with that, but you have to be... And also, I mean, West Indies, the reason they're now producing fast bowlers, they've changed their pitches, etc. They're not going to produce these fast bowlers if they play on those feather beds. So again, the whole it's been thing... A deliberate, it's been a deliberate attempt to reconnect with what you might call their true style, if, if you like. But then that goes back to Rob's point. You'll do that as long as you do have these young fast bowlers coming through and you make sure you don't lose anymore like they've done with Archer, whatever. So if you have those players, then believe in that principle. See, I, you talk about that. I find that an interesting thing because I, let's take Lancashire. Now, you boys, Bumble and Ath and Nass are playing against them. When I first started in like 98, you play against Lancashire, you are playing, you know you're playing against them just by their whole demeanour, the body language, the way that you all were just ran through that whole club. And then as you guys retired, Actually, I think Lancashire lost that a little bit, that sort of identity that you would know you were playing against Lancashire as opposed to anyone else. Um, just by the way you were, the Peter Martins, the Warren Heggs, all those people. And it looks like you're trying to get that back. Is that fair, Bumble? So you'd say that is an important thing, would you? Yeah, I, I think that Lancashire, for a, a short period, had lost their way. Uh, it became more of a corporate place and a stadium whilst they were rebuilding and so on. But they've got that back. Um, you mentioned Lancashire as a club, and I think that the leadership there now has got back to what Lancashire cricket is. And, of course, you are moving with the times. And I'm, I'm very fortunate that I, you, I can go in. I can go in the dressing room. and I'm like a, a kid going round and watching the fellow on his laptop. He's the analyst and watching the way that Mark Chilton and Glenn Chappell go about the business and the captain. And it's fascinating to see the facilities that they've got. They've got everything. They've got everything that they need. So the lads, there's really no excuse to give it the very best shot every time they play. They, they won't for nothing. I love at Lancashire, they have, uh, I don't know whether it's on the shirt or the cap or when, when a player is given his cap, um, there are some words from Jack Bond, I think, who was Bumble's great mate and teammate and captain in the early 70s. He signed me as a player, one of his final acts as, as manager. And I think the, the lines are, the traditions of this club, of this great club, are in your hands. And every player gets that when he gets his cap or his shirt or whatever. And I, I do think times move, times change, things change. I think connections with the history and culture of a place are so important. Myself and Nas are often asked to give out England caps to new players. And when, when we do it, or when I do it, I try and find a connection uh, with a, a previous cap or your cap number. And what does that mean? You're just a link in a chain. There's 600 and odd players who've come before you. There's going to be 600 and odd who come after you. But the fact that you are part of it is what makes the whole thing meaningful and important. So I think for places like Lancashire, and every club has this, connections with history are really important. You can't be burdened by history, 
But if you're not part of something that's a little bit bigger and better than yourself, what is it all about? So I, I think they're really essential, actually, to build on those things. The other thing you, you, you've always said, so you've got that. You said about Alex Ferguson earlier, you can't tell me that he hasn't got something. And the same, same with Brian Clough. He had, was it Peter Taylor was his man that they would go and they would pick people from the second division or wherever it was and they'd build that side. So I'm always of the opinion that it's about the players. You've got to have the tools at your disposal that can do it. But then the thing you said, which fascinates me about Alex Ferguson, Brian Clough, you know, whoever else is, and Nas said it, People want to play for them. They want to do well for that coach. What on earth is that? What is that sort of magic power that they have that allows people or wants people to go that extra yard? Go on, who wants to take that one? Well, I'd, I'd say respect and confidence and honesty. That really helps. You're doing the best that you can. You're dead honest with everybody. You've got the respect to the team and the people around you and particularly the spectators. It must be tough. You can tell, can't you, from some spectators' football so they, they don't they don't rate the manager. That that's that's tough. And so Klopp has got it. I mean, he's fantastic at Liverpool. I take it the Why? point that's been Why? made. He gets it. He gets Liverpool. He, Liverpool is different. Liverpool's different than Manchester, than London, than Birmingham, and they're a different set of people. Um, you know, they sing the same. They never walk alone. And Bill Shankly and the Gates. He gets it, Klopp gets it, and he got it immediately. I think there is just a bit of mystery as well, Rob, to, answer, to, 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 to try and answer your question, a bit of what you call magic powder that we can't bottle. Some people are just better at it. Like, some people are better writers of fiction, and some batsmen are better than others. Coaching and, and managing is a... Uh, an area of life where some people are just going to be better than others. And if you're talking about Alex Ferguson and Bill Shankly and these guys, you're talking about the absolute elite of the elite, John Wooden, Phil Jackson in the States. And I suspect you can't bottle it. You know, Ferguson and these guys, they all do their books, the managing books. But it's not something I think that you can just read a book and suddenly become a great manager. <laughs> I, I think there is a bit of bit of mystery powder there that we can't explain. What, uh, what about reinventing yourself? And I'm thinking of, of the football manager, Brendan Rodgers, who, you know, he, he had a tough time, was it at Liverpool, and uh, reinvented himself, went up to Scotland, got out of the way. Now he comes back to Leicester, he leaves the Premier Club in Scotland. He's reinvented himself. And again, you look at what Leicester are doing, he's got a team together again. Well, there has to be a an ability to improve as well and, and learn from your mistake. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no great age barrier, I wouldn't have thought, to these jobs of coaching and managing. And, and there should be a situation where you can improve with age and, 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 and improve as you go along and, and you learn from your mistakes. So, but getting this back, getting this back to cricket, because Keezy's made, made it into some kind of soccer Saturday special or something. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who are the should best? Jeff cricket? Stelling. You should have Jeff Stelling on it, you know. <laughs> He's looking for a gig on Soccer Saturday. Who was the best <laughs> one you've worked with, Rob? Well, foot cricket? No, football managers. Well, when you play for Man United, <laughs> who was the best manager you worked with? Uh, well, I'd say this is the thing I find hard with it. I think your best coaches or managers are when you're younger, generally. You know, so Ask Point's a good one about coaches. The best batting coach I saw was a bloke out in Perth called Noddy Holder, not the singer, Bumble, <laughs> who did Langer and people like that. Because he just, if, if I wasn't hitting it well, if I was sort of open facing it or whatever like you used to, he'd tell me straight away why. And it wouldn't be that I was doing that. He'd give me the root cause. He was a fantastic coach. And he'd make you feel better about your game. But that was, again, like this sort of magical thing that they have where they're just good people who make you feel better the best coach I had of a team was probably Graham Ford because he got out of your way because I was a bit older then so at that stage he Did would do whatever John Inverarity Keezy John Inverarity was very good but he was there for 12 weeks and he was similar to uh, the Noddy Holder where he would you know, he would be a very good coach that would help you play better. You know, he wasn't there long enough to be a manager of the team. 
But the ones that I thought what you said was absolutely right at the start as well, Anne, that there's more bad coaches than there are good ones. And every coach has a great intention. Every single manager, leader in every business is doing things you think for the right reasons to make you all better, to have success. But so many get it wrong. And Graham Four was good for the Trevor Bayliss reason is that he didn't put any restrictions on you. He was just, you know, bat well, bowl well, and field well, you'll win games of cricket. And that just got out your way. He wasn't, you know, bad coaches would tell you, yeah, let's have wickets in hand by the end of the day, or let's, you know, don't do this, leave the ball well, or don't do that. And that would drive you mad. Just to pick up on your point, Keezy, it's, it's also knowing when to speak and when not to speak as a coach. Because, you know, like in a test match environment, you'll see a new player. I go back to my first tour as captain and Duncan, his first tour as well. First time he was on board in South Africa. And we had Chris Adams, as, uh, as Ath will know. And Duncan saw Chris virtually for the first time in the nets and came up to me and went, he's got hard hands. He's going to go at it hard out here. And he's going to nick off a few times. And Duncan being Duncan got it right. Chris struggled. He went hard at the ball outside off stump against Donald and Pollock on some spicy pitches and nicked off. So what does Fletcher do in that situation? A lad who's just come in the side, who's played all that way all his career, on the morning of a test match or the two days before in practice, do you go up to that individual and try and tell them that and give them negative thoughts and make them change? Or do you just have to sit back and go cross your fingers and hope that you're wrong and change it down the line? So it's when you speak as well, as a coach, because a bad bit of advice or a, a good bit of advice at the wrong time can also have negative effects on a player. Which leads into one point that in cricket, at that level, at the highest level, actually selection is just as important as, as, as coaching. I would actually have the best coaches, the best technical coaches, like your noddy holder, Rob. I'd have those working with the 16 to 19 age group so you get good habits drilled into them at a key age when you're developing as a player. And what you want at the highest level, I think, then, are good selectors to work out who the best people are in county cricket. So you've got the best people being picked for the international side and then good managing of that side at, at that level. Um, but in terms of the technical coaches, like India do with Rahul Dravid, yeah. Rahul Dravid running the under-19s, I think get your best technical coaches in that key 18 to 19 age group. Spot on. I, I agree with that. That Dravid, a wonderful player, one of the best in the world, has gone into that uh, talent spotting, I should think. And he will have the ear of the selectors and say, this guy's ready and, and perhaps give him a little bit longer. The other intrigue at the minute is Alex Stewart, who's a great mate of ours, a wonderful player, one of England's very best. He's, he's in that managerial role, isn't he, at Surrey? It's a massive club, a huge club. And they've just made a move, haven't they? Di Benuto is going and not coming back. And so he's made the move. Vikram Solanke is now the head coach. So, you know, that, that's a, a big move for Vikram. He's a wonderful lad. He's done all sorts of jobs with a, a PCA and so on. Um, he's got the right nickname, hasn't he, for the job? The gaffer. The gaffer. The gaffer. <laughs> yeah. He, he, and he, he, again, I, I think that he, he's found a great place for him because he is Surrey cricket through and through. He's, be dead honest, he'll get great respect. Now he's made a move and he's promoted his batting coach, hasn't he? He was batting coach, I think, yeah. Vikram, who's a very impressive young fella. But this goes to my point from earlier. When you heard about Vikram Solanke now, were you slightly surprised anyone? Did you think, oh, hang up, I thought they'd go for some big overseas name or something. I think it's absolutely Well, I was really right. pleased. I was really pleased he's gone for Vikram because he's obviously watched him for 12 months. He's an impressive lad, Vikram. You're a clever lad. And Alex Stewart has obviously liked what he sees. There's so many times, if you're too close to that manager... He'll go, ah, oh, no, 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 I need, I need somebody who I don't know. Well, he obviously knows Solanke and he, he, he'll feel he's made the right decision. Oh, but absolutely, I agree completely. It's just the way that we just seem to see our coaches. We just don't seem to give them the credit. And it's great now. You look, Chris Silverwood's got 
Matt Walker going along, Glenn Chapel. It's time that we really start pushing English coaches. Is that yeah, I mean, it's it's very, got, one good thing out of COVID, maybe, is because obviously it's less interconnection between countries and the whole quarantine period, etc. Less willing to fly over, leave family. One good thing that might come out of it is a domestic cricket and younger domestic cricketers might get pushed forward. I think I did a piece on this really early in the whole COVID situation, but also young domestic coaches. There is always that option of, shall we get it from somewhere else? I still believe though, Rob, get the best person for the job. Don't just go the other way. I will get him because he's English. I see sometimes too much in county cricket and I, believe, I agree with what Bumble and Ath say about Lancashire people knowing the Lancashire way uh, and Ferguson knowing the Busby way, etc. But I do see too much in county cricket jobs for the boys. You used to play here. You used to captain here. You're one of the stalwarts of the club. We have to find you a job at the club. If you keep doing that, you will just end up with, with the same club mentality that you've always had. You'll never change. If you need to change, you'll never change because it will just be the same system. So pick the best person available with one eye on someone local, someone who understands the club. We, 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 touch, we touched on the 100 earlier very briefly and that, that was a, a, a disappointment to me that I thought it was a great opportunity for young English coaches and uh, they've gone for the razzmatazz and that was a, a slight disappointment for me. But can, I, can I pick you up on that though, Bumble? You've got to view those 100 sides or IPL sides as businesses. If you were at Vodafone or, you know, wherever, massive businesses, you wouldn't be going, oh, let's, there's a bloke become available, but he's not English, or just you'd pick the best person available. And the argument... How, really do, you, how, do, you become the be how do you become the best person if you're never given an opportunity? Well, these people that have got the jobs have won things. You know, Stephen Fleming, Bumble just mentioned Darren Lehman. Darren Lehman was doing a very good job before Sandpaper Gate. Stephen Fleming, everywhere Stephen Fleming has been, he's been successful. So you have to have that success. So I'll ask the question on here, who have been the successful England coaches domestically? You'd say Peter Moores. He was given his yeah. job, didn't quite take it, didn't quite work out. Chris Silverwood with Essex when he came, he, he did very well. He's been given the England job. I would argue that if you do well domestically, now you should be pushed and you will be pushed. Who are the other successful domestic coaches? Well, I, I would say Anthony McGrath. I think he's doing a good job down there, but you'll know more than me. Uh, the recruitment of players is good. They're a very competitive side. Um, Matt Walker seems to be doing well down at Kent. Um, it's the opportunities that, that you mentioned Vodafone and, and big companies. That wasn't the way that the 100 came in. Initially, the IPL is like private franchise, but whereas the 100 was uh, all the money would stay within the county game. I, I just, what gnaws away at me is the affinity for that short period of a total stranger to that club and the recruitment of the players. I think, I think you could have it as with 100 would become a long term. Stephen Fleming is, you know, linked with, with Chennai. He is, he is their coach. He's worked with Dhoni. You know, you, I think that you, you have to have him for a long time. I completely agree. Even with your overseas player, with any franchise, you look at the best franchises, they have been the ones that have not just gone off and bought every year. And Bangalore just get the best five batsmen that are available. Don't worry about the bowlers and we'll change coaches, etc. The best ones have created, even though they didn't have a you know domestic side, they've created something by keeping that group together. Coaches, backroom staff, captain, they're the ones that win things. Right. Anyone got anything else to add on coaching? No. Perfect. No. Um, <laughs> no. Boys, thank you very much. Full steam ahead for the 8th of July and live cricket. How good would that be? Uh, plenty of content on the Sky Cricket YouTube channel. You can watch everything we've done from lockdown and lots of other stuff. Um, and if you've got any opinions on what we've said in this vodcast at Sky Cricket's Twitter is the way to go. Stay well, everyone. Thank you.